Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Broken Art Podcast. My name is Adam, your co-host. My name is Callie Medley, your other co-host. The Broken Art Podcast is where we talk about all things music, theater, the performing arts, everything else in between, and all with our amateur expertise. How are you still awake right now? Still awake. The craziest week. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like we mentioned, I finished filming this this project that I was I was cast in. It was just yes. a short reading. I have I have I have a really interesting story to tell. <gasps> oh dish. Um so so it was a full length play, a new play. Um and I was cast as the lead. Uh it's a dramatic Oh I didn't piece. know that. Yeah. Anyway. It, it well, was a Miss Joe Schma- Oh my gosh, you know, if it wasn't for me, no one on this podcast would know that you're like a credible actor person. They would think <laughs> that you're like, I have been in New York for 40 years, you know, I, I'm running the circuit, you know? Like, no, no, you're like a legit person. That's all I have to say. Friend break, best friend break. Okay, go ahead. Um, but so it, it's this fully dramatic piece about this young 15 year old girl, like, uh waking up one day and finding her dad missing and so she's on this mission to find him and then making discoveries about her life and her dad's life and uncovering all these lies and then coming to terms Mm -hmm. with you know his eventual death i don't want to spoil it but i did oh Um, yeah no spoilers no spoilers no spoilers but i mean it's a huge emotional journey right and and so this last Mm -hmm. day of filming we're filming the last two scenes of the play and it's like this huge breakthrough climactic moment um that's really emotional for all the characters and then the last scene is uh lucy my character's monologue that Mm. ends the show and it's really about process it's 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 going through it and Mm. uh and so i'm like trying to like it's that day right and i know it's coming so i'm Mm -hmm. like all right just gotta get into that emotional place we have our dinner break the only two things we have to do are these two scenes Mm -hmm. so i go to the bathroom like i'm just gonna like chill out meditate listen to a sad song and Mm. then out of nowhere my nose starts bleeding no and like not just like a nosebleed like i'm talking like chronic like pouring blood out of my nose oh no um for how long do you think your longest nosebleed has lasted i honestly oh my gosh i've had nosebleeds since i was in like elementary school um i don't know like two three five minutes i don't know i don't know what that yeah that's what i mean like everyone i talk to is like yeah, like I don't, I don't get nose. But I used to get them as a kid. I don't really get them anymore. Right. I, I, this happens to me, and I wonder if I have a problem. I wonder if something's wrong. Uh-huh. But like, two or three times a year, I'll get these like, this. I'll have like a week where I just like get nosebleeds, and then will be like one really, really, really bad one. Well, this Ooh. really, really, really bad one happened to be on my dinner break which, oh no okay great i'm on dinner break it's like you know 5 20 i have plenty of time to get it under wraps mm-hmm. this thing lasted 40 minutes it did not it lasted 40 minutes what and did it, you do i i was literally I, there was points where i just had to like like let my nose like just drip just like drip into yeah. yeah i know it's really gross and i should not be talking about it but... did you have your face <laughs> over a bucket and stuff or what i i i just let it drip into the toilet bowl i didn't know what else to do it was like, <laughs> bad i mean it was ridiculous <laughs> but it was like it was, i know it's a ridiculous <laughs> but it, and and so i'm like trying to like and i'm trying to get into this like mode of like all this stuff but i'm like getting lightheaded because I'm losing all this blood from my brain, <laughs> like all this stuff. Um, but 
and I, I I mean I tried everything I tried all the different tactics to like make it stop and then mm-hmm. it just wouldn't stop did you and try then, cauterizing it with a hot needle um I did not no <laughs> I, I did not, I did no. not. Okay. Um, but it was so random, and of course it would happen right during that part. Did it stop by the time you well, started recording again? That's the thing. Like we were, our dinner break was over at six, and so it was like five fifty-five. Wasn't letting up. I was like, oh my gosh. So I stuck a little like tissue paper in my nose, put my mask back on, went to the stage manager. <laughs> in my costume which i had to get undressed because i didn't want to bleed all over my costume uh so i got back dre- i got dressed again and went to our stage manager i was like hey so i'm like dealing with this i don't know if i'm gonna be ready by the time we shoot um so just know that uh and he was a sweetie about it uh-huh. and, um so i go into the bathroom at the studio and i take out the little toilet paper from my nose and it's it's gone. It's clear. It like stopped. Like right there. Wow. Dionysus was looking after you. I, and I was like, you know what? Maybe it's a good thing because instead of focusing all that time and getting nervous, maybe, mm. maybe I would have gotten nervous. I was too busy like freaking out because I just didn't know what, <laughs> I didn't know what, the, like, so. <sighs> oh, wow. To tell. In lieu of you not sleeping, um i have slept enough for you um yeah you're on quarantine (laughs) part two two. yes okay so this is super super fun um so when i when i was really really sick those weeks ago um i didn't have a positive test result um i kept you know i kept testing i kept testing back negative it was like okay yeah whatever um, so I assumed it was just a really, really bad flu. Um, I still don't have my sense of smell. This was this was the week before Thanksgiving that this happened. Um, and now it's uh, the week, uh, it was the ninth today, if when we're recording. Um, and oh my gosh, bless his heart, one of my roommates, he got the COVID-19. And that means I have to quarantine as well for another 10 days. Um, which is kind of sad, but um, again, I'm thankful that I don't have any symptoms yet. Um, I'm able to work from home still. Um, So uh, I've been sleeping all day and a new video game that I've been waiting for, for literally eight years comes out tonight at 11. So catch me doing that until three in the morning tonight. It It feels so weird to me that you had symptoms. You went through it. You, for all you know, you had COVID-19. 100%. I just think I got, I was testing at the wrong time. First time I got tested was too, way too early, I think. Okay. But, okay. So, so even though you've been through COVID and, and supposedly are, immune or having a good chance of being immune i don't know how Mm. that works right but but because your roommate tested positive now because of your your job's policy you have to quarantine anyway regardless i have to i have to stay home because still because i still didn't get a positive um test result Mm -hmm. no um so there's nothing on paper to say that i did have it um, and then again, it could have just been a, um, a really, really bad case of the flu. We don't know. And because of that uncertainty, um, we have to go with the safety. Um, I mean, I want, I want to be at work, you know, but I got the safety and like, I'm still able to record the podcast. I obviously can't go to my office because that's in a different building. Right. Um, but I'm still able to record on here and you're on my piano right now. Nice. Handy dandy piano sort of thing because I don't want the whole double chin thing. Right, right. We were doing that. Yeah. I saw on your social media today that it's like Christmas outside. What the heck? It snowed for the first time in New York. It's officially (laughs) Christmas. I was so excited. I just got out of the shower 
And I looked out the window and it was flurrying. And I was like, oh my goodness. So I grabbed my phone. I documented the experience. I jumped on, um, I jumped past my bed, like on my bed and out my window onto my fire escape, still in my towel, <laughs> just celebrating. We're going to get hypothermia. Well, I mean, yeah, my, my friend DM'd me and he was like, I hope no one was standing below you. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Well, hey, everyone. I'm super, super, super excited to welcome our next guest to the podcast. Uh, give a virtual round of applause to Ob. I'm assuming Ooh. everyone's clapping oh. right now. Um, Ob, like I was kind of saying in a preface, has been a dear friend of ours for many, many, many years. Um, when both of us, uh, when we had more hair, I mean, I wasn't balding <laughs> or anything at the time. Um, but we go way back to like orchestra days. And oh stuff yeah, and like everything. freshman year. I mean, even before like all city orchestra in like sixth and seventh grade. Oh my gosh. And I just- We've been going strong. We were going, we've been going strong for a long time. And I remember my first impression of you was just being an, a, a baller cello player. Like <laughs> I didn't know that you like play guitar or like, uh, you were a French horn beast at the time. Oh. I, I heard you play cello and I was like, what the heck? I forget what notes are on the staff sometimes. What's going oh on? Oh my God, you're so uh, kind. <laughs> um, but how are you? How have you been? Like, what's going on? Um, well, I'm still in Colorado. Um, I just graduated in May with my French horn degree. Yes. From the University of Northern nice. Colorado. Yeet. Nice. It was. What's the, what's the uh, mascot there? at the uh bears oh go it's, bears yeah go bears no, uh it's bears. like skull skull bears i think people say skull? i think i went to one sports game the whole time that i lived <laughs> <laughs> it's okay this is a is a music what? and theater podcast yeah like, we're not yeah. we're not getting any of that traffic you're in good company you're in good company um uh, yeah i yeah we graduated uh it was lackluster because the school was out already and it was online and then on my graduation day I um bought a large bottle of wine and cried on my floor <laughs> I think that's um, a good coping thing to do you know you're still kind of celebrating last day of school you know yeah mm -hmm. I was it was definitely a lot um mm -hmm. since graduating I'm still living in Greeley I'm doing a year here mm -hmm. um the plan was to work full time and save up. Not really working because of the pandemic, but you know, um, right. I am living in a very cute, like 19th century apartment building um, oh with my, my dear friend and my two cats and my pet snail. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have to say, um, Ob's um, Instagram aesthetic, top shelf. Oh my God. Top shelf stuff. And I did not know that a snail could be photogenic. Like, I know we're gonna talk about like <laughs> arts and music stuff later, like the goal of this, but, but I wanna talk- No, no, uh, the snail. Snail. <laughs> the snail. I like, I didn't get it at first until I saw a video of your snail like eating like a leaf or something. And it had like a nice little fuzzy filter and there was like Lana Del Rey or something playing in the background. I don't, <laughs> yeah. but I was like- It was probably like Pine Grove. <laughs> yeah, I think it was. And I was thinking like, where can I get a photogenic snail? So like, what, what's with snails, Ob? Can you give us a run now? What's with, um, so, so last year I um, had like a super rough breakup. Like, you know, when you date someone and you're like, oh, oh man, no, you're not the, no, bad. Yeah. And then you uh -huh. have to like get out of there, but like gracefully, cause you've been dating them for a long time. Mm. Um, had to do that and uh, I was, I was really going through it and my friend put on her Instagram story one day she was like hi everyone um so I bought a snail from Ukraine and they're not legal to have here because they mess up the ecosystem as they're released into the wild but then they sent me two do you want one and I was like me I want a snail <laughs> <laughs> I, I had no idea how to take care of it I drove to Denver that day to pick up this 
giant African land snail. Um, and I named him Pistachio. And oh. he is, I mean, like, he's, I've had him for a year. And the lifespan is 10 years. But he's only half grown. And he's going to be, like, like that big when he's finished oh, growing. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> For reference, that's like a little bit bigger than a softball, right? Yeah, or... like he'll be like a pound, probably. He'll be oh. like a whole pound. And oh his, his shell is going to be really, yeah. He's like, <laughs> when he's fully extended, he's like uh, like eight or nine inches long right now. Wow. Oh my <laughs> really scary. gosh, that is so cool. There's so much backstory to talk about. Okay, so what's the breed of the snail called again? Um, Giant African land snail. Okay, giant African <laughs> land snail. Your friend got it from the Ukraine. Yes, illegally. Two illegally, <laughs> illegally got two from the re- <laughs> two for the price of one from the Ukraine in Denver. And, and now you Denver. Have- now I have them. Yeah, I. Um, Denver is like an hour from here, but like the traffic's gotten so bad lately, so it's like an hour and a half at least, and then an hour, another like thirty minutes to find parking. And I was like, I don't care. Two hours, I'm ready. Um, <laughs> but it's uh, yeah, we're we're going strong. He's very picky. He only likes lettuce. Um, <laughs> I try to get him to eat healthy things, and he'll just like go into his shell and then like try to go into hibernation. And I'm like, no, don't we all? Don't we? All? <laughs> oh my god! I it's like, I don't want to eat broccoli either. It's okay. <laughs> I I would go on my tirade about how I want an opossum, but this is not what this podcast is about. Yeah. We, we can have a separate about, opossum podcast. We could. We could have in a uh, podcast. A yeah. Pod- <laughs> yeah, uh, we can have our own exotic, <laughs> like fun animal podcast. We could have. Yeah, and I'm here we for can that. Review them and stuff. Oh my gosh, the Broken Art Podcast podcast network. All right, we are getting so off topic, but <laughs> oh, when yeah, do we true. ever stay on topic? <laughs> um, so again, thank you for coming on. So first things first, what's your history? with like being a musician and a performer like when did you start where did that journey lead you until you know now graduating with performance in the um really really circular long french uh trumpet thing called the french horn oh yes um well uh like most i don't know i feel like most music kids um i started playing piano when i was five um my teacher was like a DePaul graduate, very, very strict, very, very hard ass, like Mm -hmm. uh, made me practice 140 minutes a week when I was like six years old and made me like record it and write it down for her. Um, And I was genuinely always afraid when going into lessons that I wasn't going to be good enough. Mm -hmm. And so um, I kind of had like that, uh, like the overworking culture put into me as a very young child by- a well-wishing but like too intense teacher for like little kids you know um it's hard to it's hard to take a kindergartner to even sit for like two minutes i've been teaching elementary music classroom for a couple weeks having them sit for one minute to do something is a chore so like 140 minutes that boggles my mind oh my gosh yeah it was a lot um it was a lot (laughs) But I took lessons with her until the end of junior year of high school. Um, But at that point, I had started playing the cello. I started cello when I was five also, but then I quit for a little bit and then took it back up again at 10 and then started playing the flute and the horn at 10, like in fifth grade when they start you in band. Um, Mm -hmm. And at that point, uh, I was just like, you know, I mean, the drill of uh, go home and practice like four different things and then rehearse for your like four different ensembles. Oh my gosh. Do your homework and like, you know, be a person. Um, And it was definitely like, I look back on myself when like in high school and even like middle school and elementary school. I was like, wow, I kind of like deprived myself of a lot of, I think we all did like the mm-hmm. music programs that we were in were really incredible, but they also asked a lot of us, especially were if you were double dipping. So intense. Yes. If you were, because we were, you know, there's such a high standard. Um, and I also believe in this generation, there's such a high standard put on um, 
you know, kids, I think uh, way too young. Um, yeah. And it may instill such a, a really great sense of artistic integrity um, and what it means to be an artist. But the second time we're overworking these kids a lot. Yeah, keep going with that. That's great, thank you. Yeah, um, yeah, it was, it was just so much and like not to be dramatic, but um, my brain kind of formed around I mean, you know, I feel like everyone's kind of a people pleaser when they're a kid because they want their parents to be proud of them and they want to be liked. Mm -hmm. um, but I figured out from a very early age that like if I was good at music, my parents would be proud of me and then other people would like me and think that I was good. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I mean, you know, unhealthy coping mechanisms all day. Yes, <laughs> support that. I paid my therapist too much to talk yeah. about that. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I just go in circles sometimes, but uh <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was kind of like, you know, it, I don't know, I have pretty like intense OCD. Um, and like, I will latch on to something and then like, hang on to it for literal dear life. Because I somehow convinced myself that like, other things won't work. It's like black or white. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so music became very, very quickly a means of like, receiving love from other people rather than just playing <clears throat> music because I love it um mm -hmm. and like I mean I mean yeah we were pretty good pals in high school and mm -hmm. I I do not like who I was in high school <laughs> like I feel like I'm not even I, I feel like I'm barely that person at all like not even close and yeah but I look back on it and I'm just like man I I just like didn't know you know I mean you're just you're 15 16 and all you've known is being really good at stuff and right. winning awards in music and everyone, everyone would be proud of you. And then you sit down at the end of the day and you're like, do I like this though? <laughs> yeah, you can. Yeah. I, I think when you're going back to trying to think, okay, how, how is that sustainable? Right. Mm -hmm. If you're kind of, there's always kind of like this avalanche of like, okay, now to the next thing, how can I, how can I keep getting this approval that from this, I think is the only way to get this approval from, you, you know? And I think this is a great segue into, you know, we grew up in a very conservative state in a very conservative town. Um, and the three of we, the three of us, we are from yeah. the same place. <laughs> no DAC BBs. <laughs> no, no DAC people who are now in three different time zones. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, how far we've come. Uh, but I'm surprised that when I, you know, I'm talking to both of you, of like, we turned out completely different than what we were raised to be, you, you know? Absolutely. I think. Mm -hmm. um, so like, when you graduated from high school and then you made the choice to go out of state mm -hmm. and uh, to pursue a degree in music, what was that like? What was that thought process like? Were you thinking about, oh my gosh, get me the heck out of this part of the state or like oh there's this great program over here what was that thought process like I think it was kind of a little bit of both of those things um mm -hmm. I was dying to get out of North Dakota um mm -hmm. from the moment that we moved there when I was like four three and a half um I literally just like felt in my gut I was like I do not belong here and mm -hmm. like not in, in any like I'm too good for this place kind of way but like like that's not it at all it's like a just it was like a dissonance like mm -hmm. I mean you know like the culture there is really intense um right or lack of culture um <laughs> <laughs> where's the flavor <laughs> where's the flavor? um yeah so I I just like went straight to music I was like I have to do music mm -hmm. um French horn is like the instrument that I like the most it's I have this like I'm like naturally good at it I feel like I have a good work ethic so I feel like I'll do well in music school and I want to be in an orchestra um and I really hung on to that probably for way too long because once I started going I mean my first semester of college um we did auditions mm -hmm. and I I mean obviously worked really hard on my audition piece and uh, went on audition with all of my friends and we stayed up till midnight when they post the results because that's like the thing they do here they like make you stay oh, up wow. and everyone goes and looks at midnight and it's like really dramatic <laughs> um, wow stressful 
yeah it's very stressful um but I just remember it was like pouring rain and we like sprinted all the way to Fraser Hall which is like our music hall and mm-hmm. we were all like rejoicing over our ensemble placements and um I had not looked at mine because I was just like concerned with everybody else's and mm-hmm. everyone's like oh what about yours what did you make and I looked and they had put me in symphony and wind ensemble and a graduate brass quintet and those are like like those are like the top ensembles for classical music like classical music majors here wow and i like instantly had a target on my back oh wow it was i mean like it was a good experience like i had a lot Mm -hmm. of it was you know thrown into the fire i was not i was not musically mature enough to be in those groups at the level that they wanted me to be at but like sure yeah like it wasn't like it was super fun like I worked I practiced until like midnight every night um, oh my gosh but it was like yeah it was really hard to like go about classes with all these people that I literally only saw in class because we never had ensembles together mm-hmm. and it just kind of like made me really question like it doesn't make me feel very good that I like did better better than other people Mm-hmm. Or like they thought I would be better in these ensembles, and it doesn't make me feel very good to perform separate from people that I care about. Mm-hmm. And like it was, it was like a lot of cognitive dissonance because I really wanted it, but at the same time, it was kind of like claustrophobic in a way, you know? Yeah, yeah. you're kind of put in that position where it's like, I think, and I honestly believe this. I think fine arts majors I especially think like music majors in particular I think they a lot of them look back on their college career and be like was that fun yeah you know because I'm you know I'm going to be graduating soon I'm going to be moving or whatever and I'm kind of thinking about like all the time I spend in like a practice room and practicing for ensembles and all these ensemble rehearsals and the expectation is that, okay, this is what we're going to be doing for the, what they perceive what we're going to be doing for the rest of our lives. We're going to, we're going to make them go into it because of what makes them better. And like, we're part of quality things, right? But that kind of just kind of takes away from what college is supposed to be and what it is for a lot of people. Um, And you're kind of shoehorned into that. So like, what did you do to like kind of stay creative through that entire time and be like, you know, I'm going to choose the music. I'm going to choose the arts every day. Um, What's that like? I, it took me a minute to kind of find my niche to mm-hmm. do like do that here. Um, Cause I literally did not know one person <laughs> in this city. I just <laughs> moved here. Um, but I had this coffee job and I met somebody who played at like played on the like worship team at this like really cool like inclusive hip church and I mentioned that I played cello and they were like oh my god come play with us um and I showed up and then like uh, next thing you know I next thing I know I'm like committed to being on this like worship team Mm -hmm. um and then through that I met my bandmate um who's like pretty established in this town and he um has a band called giants and pilgrims uh which i guess that's my band now too um, oh nice I met, yeah i i met him and we just like yeah it was nothing like music school like he was like you come and we can play like folk tunes we can play like covers um we opened for Devotchka last year which was like the best day of my whole freaking wow. life like, oh my yeah. gosh it was so magical I cried so hard I was like this is <laughs> all and I mean but this was like it totally you know separate from my musical studies mm-hmm. pretty much I was singing and playing cello and playing horn occasionally and it was just just fun and I like I credit that to like pulling me out of my like stuck in the mud of trying to prove my worth with a chunk of metal um Mm -hmm. yeah oh my gosh that's a great Callie do you have anything before I kind of well and then you also had some time overseas right yeah um yeah yeah I did yeah um I kind of forgot about that for a second uh (laughs) 
I actually like dream in Korean. Like I don't know that much <gasps> Korean, but I like dream where I'm having conversations or I'm like back at my old school. So it's like it was so memorable for me. Um, but I went to Korea uh, spring of 2019 for my spring junior semester. Um, so I like did my recital early and everything, so I could just have like three months off of school because their semester starts late. Um, mm -hmm. And then I went there and they, I, I wasn't in music school there. I was just taking four regular like classes mm. and had literally all the time in the world. I had like four days off a week and the other days where I didn't have off, I only had class for like three hours. So wow. <laughs> um, wow. yeah, and it was like four and a half months of like free time in a beautiful, beautiful space um, with a, an incredible music building. I could just go and play piano and I brought my horn so I could just like play horn if I wanted to, but mm -hmm. um, was there and I was just like, I dedicated time every day to journaling and um, just like letting myself feel my feelings that I have like turned off for the past amount of years just to like mm -hmm. get through stuff. Um, and yeah, I figured out that I was gay when I was in Korea. <laughs> Support it. Support yeah. it. We love it. Yeah, it was it was wild. I was just journaling <laughs> one day and I was like, what? <laughs> Cause like you guys, I like I like had a girlfriend when I was younger. And I was so like, we weren't like um, we were like little-ish. Like I think uh -huh. I was like 12 or 13. But like I had completely forgotten about it because I was so ashamed. I was like, I am like so embarrassed. I can never tell my parents, like they can never know, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. um, and it had like just gone into my like trauma erased brain, you know? <laughs> yeah. Right, uh-huh. Um, and then it like came back to me one day and I literally was so like just dumbfounded. I was like, wow, mm -hmm. this is wild. So it was just like a total reset for my brain to just mm -hmm. come back to America and pursue things that I'm really interested in because at that point I was like okay I don't really want to be in an orchestra but I'm three quarters of the way through this degree I just need to get it done mm -hmm. right um and so I came back and senior year I made it a point to take private like theory lessons with um one of our theory department heads um who used to be like he was a professor at like UNT and like McGill so I was just like uh -huh. damn I need to study with you yeah uh and I just thought I would just do like a refresh so that I wouldn't like fail my grad entrance exams <laughs> um <laughs> and then we ended up just like digging so deep into like atonal analysis and like um we only study like women composers and um he was like you know what you are like this is like something you could do like you could be a theorist like you could be a professor you could I mean he's like you're a badass and you could be a badass and teach other people how to be badass like, yeah different <laughs> it was so cool it was just like and I don't think I would have found that out if I hadn't have gone to Korea if I hadn't have had that experience of just like you know hang out with yourself and think about what you actually want to do not have to like work or study every second of your life yeah. oh my gosh yeah and it's so interesting that you talked about um having a girlfriend like I my first kiss was with a girl and like I like I've had like experiences and feelings for women but like my entire life I just totally didn't like validate those experiences and I, I almost like wrote them off as like not even happening right mm -hmm. like and so I totally get that like and then you come and you're by yourself and you're kind of evaluating your life and in whatever ways and then you're like oh wait I think that was something <laughs> I think he was like er? <laughs> <laughs> yeah but I you know it's it's so crazy and and I think growing up in the town that we did and like how closed off everyone was and and still are right that we just mm -hmm. kind of, it, it's this really big societal thing that 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 we've 
struggles that, that we've had to try to navigate through and like thank god we all like you know have spent time away from that and and have been able to to come to terms with not come to terms but embrace ourselves and, and get to know yeah. ourselves you know see what happens we left and then we all became queer and that was, <laughs> it was something in the True. water we literally all wow <laughs> mass <laughs> exodus mass gay exodus of oh my God. Forward, we are gonna over the world oh my god it's the agenda they're turning the frogs gay <laughs> um, oh my god i saw this thing <laughs> Uh, I think I posted it on my story a couple of days ago, but it was like, millennials, why is everyone suddenly gay? And it was like, because we were able to live past 30. And like, we missed out on like, I mean, as queer young people, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, North Dakota, we wouldn't get that anyway. But like, our elders, like queer elders, pretty much got killed off by HIV. Mm -hmm. And like, also like starvation and homelessness and police brutality. And it's like, wow. Like we like if we would have grown up even somewhere that wasn't North Dakota, we still wouldn't have had like that. Like right. oh, I know yeah. this person that's like sixty and is a lesbian. Like yeah, I didn't know and, any lesbians. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. and and even if you know the, the the those that have survived, you know it, it's still like there are some cases where it's it's still secret and it's still a secret part of their lives that they aren't mm -hmm. willing to share because you know it. You know, it's just it's heartbreaking. It's yeah, heartbreaking. And I'm glad like, that. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. oh uh, I just, it's just like it's presented to us as children, like as I mean, you know, it's like this is something to be ashamed of. Like I, I have like a vivid memory of my mom taking me. Like she was on Facebook when I was a kid, and she was like, "Oh my God, look at this guy that I went to school with." he thinks that he's a girl now and like is so like she like just gave me this whole description of like how lost and full of like just like filled with the devil this like beautiful black trans woman was mm -hmm. and I just like remember like making the like connotation like trans gay satan <laughs> <laughs> right uh-huh and it, it takes a while to get over that you know especially when you're like oh man is that me <laughs> well, it was when you're with that sort of otherness that happens, right? Mm -hmm. um, because I grew up and uh, I have a sibling that's gay and I have a, a cousin who's trans. And when I was younger, that was such a like, shh, don't mm. tell anyone. Sort oh, of so yeah. for, you know, me or whatever, I grew up like, uh-oh, uh, uh you know. Um, but is that now, person pretty? <laughs> is that person pretty? No, it's evil to find that person pretty. But now we are able to grow, and I think that's the, I think that's such a beautiful thing about kind of the culture that we're in right now. With, I mean, acknowledging all of the bad things that happened. I think a lot of the good things right now is that people like us and people around the world um, who come from more conservative areas who have great people there and who have changed my life and you know i'll be teaching back there um, in a couple mm -hmm. weeks so it's not like i think it's like the worst place on earth but that we're able to grow um in ourselves and find acceptance where we wouldn't be able to find that before you know mm -hmm. and kind of lean into ourselves in that fact um so this is kind of a great transition into like kind of talking about inclusivity right um yeah and like how with some past traumas that we've had and with this present um, gift to create music, how can we reconcile that? Like, how do you use music of, or the arts? Um, what vehicle is that for you? Like, what's the relationship between the two about uh, being queer in the arts and being an active uh, musician and creator? That's like something that I think about really quite often um, because my current plan is to get my master's and PhD in theory, um, like specializing in atonal theory by women and like people of color composers, um, because like it's music academia, as you know, just loves white men. Um, they, I think it's an unhealthy obsession. 
it's the really whole country, scary. Like, <laughs> it's the whole country. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to America. If you're not white and a guy, fuck you. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, I mean, I was really discouraged going through all of my theory courses, all of my forms analysis and styles and context and history of instruments and early music and it only being white people and like straight people, which like nothing wrong with straight people. We love you, hat babies. But at the same time, like it was just like really discouraging to get home and be like, cool, I just spent my entire day learning about like Mm -hmm. you know um so like as a professor when I'm a professor um I think one of the biggest steps I'm going to take to like using music um academics in specific to like highlight like diversity at all in um, music theory um Mm -hmm. as I I really want to write a textbook I have like I don't know how you guys felt about like atonal theory but like it's my favorite topic in the whole world. I'm obsessed with it. That's how you know you should be a theory teacher. <laughs> yeah. If you look at Schoenberg and Tone Rose and Serialism oh, and you're like, I love this, then let, let please go off and be a theory <laughs> teacher. You have an obligation to do that. I do. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was so wild. I had took the, I took theory four and I was just like, I would like literally cry every class because I was just like so fascinated. I was like, this oh is so God. beautiful. It's in the numbers. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like uh, at the same time, we learned about Schoenberg. We learned about Fabern. Um, learned about Shostakovich. We learned about all these like WC and his like later stuff. Great, lovely composers, geniuses. Um, however, it's taught one way and it's taught with like the same five composers. And I own like five theory textbooks um, and all of them are the same basically. Mm-hmm. Um, so I really want to be that asshole professor who writes their own textbook, (laughs) but like, have it be- Makes the kids buy them. I know, be like, listen, it's not that expensive. I'm really sorry. Um, It'll be cheap. I love you, everybody. Um, Like I like picture it all the time. Like my first class shows up and it's like first day of school. And I look out and I have everybody introduce themselves. Like I have them tell me their pronouns. I tell them my pronouns. Like Mm -hmm. we have this, like understanding of like respect between each other and like then we spend the year fostering an environment where like I teach them about people who have literally sacrificed everything to write music and have given up their families their countries their whole lives to create something that means something to them and then nobody wrote about them because they weren't like I (laughs) Mm. um so that's that's one of the most important things to me for my career in academics. I and I know that will there will be pushback. I've already received pushback from professors in discussions with them of being like, "Hey, I took all your classes. I had you for like eight semesters, <laughs> literally. Um, maybe would you be able to like? Is there any way you could incorporate some diversity in here? Like there are, I mean, whether you like it or not, there were black composers writing the same thing as white composers." and there's Believe nothing it or not. about them <laughs> yeah <laughs> like can you can you even imagine um <laughs> and even better really yeah truly yeah. um and like women composers and mm-hmm. yeah it's just it's really it's a very touchy subject because music academia and academia in general is very you know it's very like it's it's sacred you know mm-hmm. it's like this is the way this is tradition this is how it's you know this is the way and it's the only way it's yeah unwilling to change with the times and I think that's where a lot of arts programs get you know uh, outdated and lost and disconnected and, and even in theater you know mm-hmm. people are afraid of telling stories and and want to revive you know whatever instead of telling new stories of people who are living in today's world. Yeah, because I mean, like, it's it's literally our life. Like, mm-hmm. why, why wouldn't we want to talk about it and teach people about it? Because there's a point where it's like, okay, you've gone back too far. <laughs> like, this was hundreds of years ago. Yeah. <laughs> what about what's happening today, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, 
yeah and it's yeah it's dodgy and it's gonna be hard um I'm kind of bracing myself for a lot of like transphobia in academia because like I want to talk at conferences and you know I mean it's hard to make people refer to you correctly as a 22 year old when you're like hey I'm pronouns are they them and <laughs> but they're going to be like yeah it'll be hard but um mm-hmm. that, I don't know that's kind of my my thoughts on that in like academia I guess um mm-hmm. in like performing whenever I'm doing like fun concerts like with my band um whenever we play a song that either I picked or like arranged or wrote um I always kind of talk about it a little bit and I I feel like when you go to a concert and you are listening to the artists like speak between the pieces or like the songs to like tell you about why they were written like Mm -hmm. that's always what I remember the most from concerts because like you can I mean I love live performances but the songs exist elsewhere but like those little stories in between um are really like beautiful intimate moments with your audience and like theirs with your with you I guess um like speak about like hey like this is a song I wrote when I had to leave somebody because like I realized that I was queer and like it was really heavy and um you know like that kind of stuff um and that's really special to me as like a performer, but also um, being able to present people with like something, people who might not have any kind of space in their head for like people that are different than them to present them with like a sweet, relatable moment that they connect with. To be like, oh, dang, like I thought the gays were wild. And then that person just told me that they loved someone. <laughs> You know, <laughs> um, it's not all gay bars and gay clubs. It's <laughs> yeah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> I am. I am such a soft gay. You guys like it's. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a baby. I'm so sensitive. So far, this has just been wholly inspiring to hear you talk about this. Up. It truly, truly has been. Um, so when I think about that, like, because you're like literally inspiring me right now. I think that's super awesome. Um, who kind of like, ins- who's like inspired you as an artist? Like, who has kind of like taken your like, just idea and affection of being an artist or a person in general and be like, oh my gosh, I want to emulate what they do. Yeah. Who is that for you or who are they for you? Oh man, okay, I wrote them down because a, I'm obsessed with lists, but B, I get anxious and forget everything that I thought I knew. Um, so I have I have a kind of a bunch, but like for different reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, like one of my biggest inspirations <laughs> is like, okay, the like Phoebe Bridgers, uh, Lucy Dacus, and um, wow, I can't I remember her name, Julian Baker. Um, like their little, the whole like, they kind of started this thing in like, indie rock music of like hi here's like messy well I mean they started it like for their little like section of like followers and stuff Mm -hmm. of just being like this is like my like these are my messy feelings I'm gonna sing about them and like maybe this is a little TMI but like I don't care because I loved someone and they stopped loving me or I didn't feel like I fit in for 10 years of my life in this place or I need to go back to therapy, but I can't do it right now. So I'm gonna like vent. And um, that those artists have really inspired me a lot as a songwriter or just like a person in general to like embrace um, like softness, you know? Like mm-hmm. being like, hey, like I know that we're all classically trained, but I wanna write a song it doesn't make sense and there's no form to it like there's no verse chorus there's no ac whatever like it's just me like showing you my emotions and like that's okay um because you know you're told and taught and trained to put on this like a totally straight face and just get through things um so those are some artists who have really inspired me in kind of that realm music and composer wise WC, the man was an asshole. He was a terrible person. He was arguably a 
Big old God. Jake I'm partial to Ravel. Because um, oh, he's a little bit more of a song. <laughs> Ravel's my favorite composer. So he's like he's that so little song. <laughs> <He's>... Yeah. <laughs> yeah talk he didn't about know Debbie's... he was writing the same thing over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know it. <laughs> he just kept orchestrating it a different way each oh, time. Oh, <laughs> Polero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love WC. Not really as a person, but um, as a composer, his evocations of color and feeling and love and sound and texture and places and thoughts um, blow my mind. I mean, like his like uh, just like simple like arias that he wrote um, or, like art songs. Um, he uses one in the key of E um, and does this whole thing where he makes E the water, like the note, the water, and has the singer be the bird. And this bird is flying in and out of the water, talking about this person that she loves. And at the end, she is taken away from the person that she loves and the bird falls in the water and it goes E, E, E down the octaves. Like that kind of stuff is, it's heartbreaking to me. Like that's, it's so beautiful. And like, that's what I think about when I think of like the essence of why I want to study music and why I want to be a theorist because I have n not one composition bone in my body like I can write like a like an indie song but I can't <laughs> write a music piece <laughs> it's just not it and it's okay because there are plenty of people who can do that um but I I did this research project last year um on my next inspiring person who's Ursula Mamlock um she is a Holocaust, well, she died a couple of years ago. I think she died in 2016. Um, but she was a Holocaust survivor, like escaped with her family to Ecuador when she was like 14. Um, and like her whole family's Jewish and like they barely escaped. And it was like, and all their other family that wasn't just her immediate family were killed by Nazis. And like, just she left her whole life behind and then went to the Mana School of Music in New York. Um, and when she was 17 <laughs> and just was like this genius wow. like pioneer for like she kind of set the stage for like women atonal composers because um she even said I watched a bunch of interviews with her and she always said that like she she's like I like to think of my style as like atonality that you feel like it's it's like holding tonality like it's like you want it to be tonal you think it's in a key and then it takes it in a different direction um and studying her music was like so humbling to me as a musician because I studied a 32 bar piece, um, one page, just a piano piece and no one else has ever written a paper on it. And I was like, okay, I have no references. I guess I'll just analyze it. And it took me the whole semester <laughs> to analyze a 32 bar piece. Oh, wow. Be because every time I looked at it, I found something new. It was a tone row and then a pattern and then like, inversions of the tone row and then the patterns turning out to be the golden ratio of Fibonacci sequence and um wow it was like it was like birth it was like my birthday every day I was like this is so <laughs> it was like it was like crack you guys like, I, was like, <laughs> I was having so much fun and we were like sitting in my professor's office and we would just be like yes and like high five um but the thing that made me love her the very most was um, about that piece. It's called Love Song of the Pigeons. And do you know Callie, big New York? Um, the American rock pigeon is a very invasive species. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and they are everywhere. And you can't walk around New York without seeing them. Yeah, um, they're the real New Yorkers. Really. They're, they're, <laughs> they're the real, like, old Italian grandmothers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, they are one of the few species um, of animals that um, mate for life, which is really special for such like a simple bird, you would think. Um, and that got me thinking, I was like, okay, cool. She's writing about pigeons. This piece was a birthday gift for her husband. There's two pigeons. They seem to have a connection. And then I figured out that she had like, made her and her husband the pigeons in the song and made the um, reverse 
um, tone row, the tone row, and then it's, it's uh, antithesis, mm -hmm. two pigeons. And they like actually with the notes arc around each other in the dance that pigeons do to mate and choose each other for life. Oh my <laughs> gosh. Blowing my yeah. mind. Oh my. <laughs> you guys, I sobbed. I was like, I, I couldn't, I was like, not okay. <laughs> it was beautiful. And like, that was the moment where my brain was like, this is what you're doing. Like, I don't care how long it takes you. Like, I want, I want so badly to be able to take all of that joy and wonder that I experienced and like give that to students because I want to be the teacher or a teacher that doesn't just like, you know, you show up to the, the class and you're like, cool, it's going to be an hour and 15 minutes of notes. I love it. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's long story short. Um, those are my like, like music people that I really look up to. Um, mm -hmm. I love Mary Oliver as a poet. Mm. Um, her, oh, like her poem, Wild Geese, it starts like, you do not have to be good. You don't have to walk on your knees. Like you don't have to follow the pattern of everybody else and just be part of the crowd. Like you can be yourself and like you are loved and you are safe and you are enough in that. And that is so meaningful to me as a little human because like mm -hmm. it's hard to believe that you guys <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just feel so small but then mary oliver really drags me out of that <laughs> 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 um and then of course of course the beautiful princess diana i have a recent oh. obsession with her <laughs> uh, we've <laughs> we've talked about um our joint love for the netflix yes. drama series the crown her complete willingness first of all her like tenacity to be like to like approach Charles at a party and be like hell yeah like hi I'm really sorry about your uncle like that really sucks you must be really devastated mm -hmm. like to just offer sympathy to someone she literally didn't know and like I mean mm -hmm. Prince Charles is the worst but like I mean <laughs> Darling, mega gross he's still alive I hope you watch this Prince Charles <laughs> but <laughs> her whole family and her friends were like you've been presented with this totally fortunate situation like she was basically forced to be princess like mm -hmm. you know I mean like they were forced to get engaged super early because like Philip told them to just like the fact that she like learned how to be a princess as an 18 year old like within a couple of weeks it was My just like gosh incredible and the dedication that she put forward only to be met by people who like didn't love her well and didn't take care of her and didn't have her best interest in mind and just wanted her to be a trophy wife you know mm -hmm. and the fact that she kept her individuality and like was really open about her eating disorder and like her mental yeah. health issues that was really huge for me because like to see somebody that the entire literal entire world worshipped be like yeah man like I, I struggle with this eating disorder and it's like really crippling and it's hard for me and I mean, like her, I don't know if you've watched the documentary of like, like uh, Diana in her own words. That's on my watch list. That's on my watch it's list. heartbreaking because there are a lot of other documentaries that paint her as like a mooch and a poser and like a victim, mm -hmm. um, like victimizing herself. But she, I feel, was very, very misunderstood and wasn't even attempted to be understood by her entire royal family. Mm -hmm. And just the fact that she came out of all of that with grace and kindness was just like, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't relate to her on like a life level, but I think she's incredible. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I the love whole her thing so much. with leading with kindness, I think, is so important because she could never uh, be what they wanted her to be. Like, she kept trying and trying and trying until she wanted to be the people's princess you know yeah. queen for everybody sort of thing and i think that's so inspiring and you don't see political figures you don't you don't see like really well-known people lead with that compassion and outwardly just i am going to step forward and love everybody despite yeah. what the foundation is telling me to do and I think that's so wholly inspiring I 
think yeah. that's so, so awesome. Her whole thing with um, <coughs> like highlighting like people who are in the hospital with AIDS, that was like so emotional for me because mm-hmm. um, I mean, anybody in the queer community, like we owe our lives and our rights and our acceptance in society to so many people who went through the AIDS crisis and still have, I mean, there are like so many people who are current, you know, like it's just, Mm -hmm. but the fact that she went to an AIDS hospital, like a children's unit and was like, I'm going to go hang out with these kids and give them a hug and tell them that I love them. Like no gloves. As long as you can get get over the fact that their mouths never open past this point. That it's always hippie. 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 <laughs> I'm smiling. I'm smiling. Do really? Can you tell? Philip William, I'm I love so you. happy <laughs> to announce that it is Christmas Day, 1964. <laughs> I promise my life, whether it be long or short, will be dedicated to upholding the sanctity of the Commonwealth. Just like, where do you learn? Okay, so here's the thing. <laughs> Callie knows this about me. Uh, I wasn't originally going to major in music. I was going to major in history. And I was Ooh. my focus was going to be on European monarchies because I find ah. them so messed up and so interesting. But these folks, they lived in their weird little castle until World War I. And they have this wildly weird accent that nobody has. It's nobody. so weird. <laughs> like, it's, they're weird, like, welsh weird roots and it's just why why do you say hippie like her 21st birthday speech i you should just do a podcast of just you imitating <laughs> well uh this is adam Bitter, and this is my impression of claire Foy giving uh queen princess this is my audition for the crown time. season five uh, this has been so fantastic. Uh, before Callie and I do our outro stuff, um, there's something that uh, Callie and I would love you to plug on this. What what do you have to plug for us? As you know, I am a non-binary human, um, and having been just discom- like super uncomfy in my body for like my whole life, um, I'm going to be getting top surgery, which is really exciting. But uh, it's also really expensive. So, um, yes, I have a GoFundMe that I started um, for myself, which feels weird. But um, queer people deserve things. So uh, support, <laughs> yes. support queer people in your life. Uh, Giving Tuesday, whatever holiday giving you like to do. Mm-hmm. That's a really good place to put that money. Um, not just for myself, but other people. Um, but yeah, I my Instagram is underscore just a peach. Um, my profile is public right now, and my GoFundMe is linked in my bio. Um, if you feel and like we'll that's something, we'll put the link down in the description for this as well. Um, yeah, so and I mean, obviously, well. no pressure or anything, but um, yeah, it is there, and um, I just yeah, it's very up in the air of how much insurance will cover but basically they're like cool we can do that for you it's ten thousand dollars <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i have my consultation and everything which is fun but um yeah that's very exciting um thank you guys for letting me plug that i appreciate it it would mean a lot to me if anybody donated it <laughs> Oh my yeah. gosh, we do appreciate you. Um, so please, 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 everyone, um, go to our description, follow um, Ob at underscore just a peach, go into that bio and click on that link there. Ob, thank you so, so much uh, for being here. Uh, virtual land, let's give Ob one more. Oh, applause. We love you. I love um, you guys too. I miss you so much. <laughs> I miss you too. Callie, where can they find us? You can find us at Broken Art Podcast, wherever you listen to your podcast and wherever you are on social media. Uh, if you have any questions that you want us to answer on the podcast or have any topic ideas or anything that you want to say to us, it could be just a random fact about yourself. You can use the hashtag Bapod on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, you can also email us at brokenartpodcast at gmail.com with any questions, comments, or concerns.
Oh my gosh. And just a reminder, um, support Ob in their top surgery again at underscore just a peach. You can find that link in the bio or you can find the link in this description. And as always, everyone, take your broken heart and make it into art. We'll see you next time. See you. Bye. <laughs>